Hey, how you doing? Justin here. Today, we've got a really interesting topic to explore. We're going to be looking at the latest science of learning and particularly how you can learn faster if you're over 25. Now, most of this information was taken from a couple of podcasts by the Huberman Lab. Uh, they were called How to Learn Faster Using Failures, Movement and Balance and another one called How to Learn Skills Faster. Now, Andrew D. Huberman, incredible dude. His podcast is fantastic on a whole range of topics. He really knows his stuff. He's the associate professor in the Department of Neurobiology at Stanford University Medicine School, right? So he's proper. Now, obviously, I am not a neurobiologist. I'm a guitar player, but I'm very interested in the science of learning and about philosophy and psychology. So the idea really in this video is for me to try and take the ideas and the concepts that he presented in there, do some further research on them as well, and then try and distill it down into things that we can actually use to help us learn guitar better and faster. A really amazing thing I realized while doing research for this particular lesson was that a lot of the concepts that he talks about in those podcasts are things that actually I was already aware of. I just didn't know how they worked. A lot of the stuff is already incorporated into the beginner practice routines. We'll see a little bit more about that later, but there's an amazing twist in the tale that is so fun. Took me a little while to figure out how it was going to get used directly for the guitar thing, but it's super duper cool. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on. After after we've covered the basic gist of how this stuff works and how we can learn most effectively. Now, the first thing we're going to talk about is neuroplasticity. It's something I'm sure you've at least heard of before somewhere along the way. I'm going to have to refer to my notes a little bit. I've carefully uh, scripted some notes, but it's impossible for me to memorize all of the bits. So I'm going to have to read a little bit off my screen down here. So please forgive me. I don't have a fancy auto cue or anything like that set up. So to put it very basically, neuroplasticity is the ability of neurons in your brain to grow, adapt, and reorganize to function in a different way than they had previously, usually as a response to some direct experience. So your brain is not set. The neurons in your brain can grow and adapt to best suit the things that you need to do probably experience and practice and all of those things that you're going to do, your musical experiences, your life experiences are going to change your brain, the way that your brain functions and the things that you're good at and the things that you're not able to do so well, all of that stuff. Your brain can change itself. In fact, there's an amazing book called The Brain That Changes Itself, all about neuroplasticity with some fascinating examples. I definitely encourage you to read that book uh, if you're interested in exploring that a little bit more. It may be a little bit old now. It seems feels like quite a long time ago that I read that book, but it's yeah, really amazing thing. So the reason children are able to learn so much faster than adults is that their brains are full of the chemicals that allow neuropathways to change and evolve and grow really quickly and really easily. These chemicals steeply decrease after the age of 25. So part of the challenge here is being able to find ways to stimulate the production of those chemicals in the brain to be able to create neuroplasticity for us older folks. If you happen to be under 25 and you're watching this video, please make the most of this time. Seriously, give yourself the best education you can because you're never going to learn things more easily than you are right now. I wrote down, uh, make sure that you get an education that includes music, languages, meditation, math, science, and physical stuff as well. Really, please, please, if you're under 25, just make the most of that time to learn as much as you can. Fill your brain with real good stuff. You can develop it later on, but you'll learn so much faster when you're young. So triggering plasticity as you get older takes a lot more effort or necessity. If you really need to do something, if you were stuck on a desert island and you managed to make yourself a bow and you needed to learn to hunt, you'd be able to learn to hunt very, very quickly because you really need to do it. Your brain knows that, so it's able to create those chemicals and create the plasticity needed to, to learn that particular skill. Guitar maybe isn't quite that necessary, right? I think it'd be difficult to, to trigger those chemicals in your brain. Although I do find it interesting that a lot of the stuff that I learned, particularly in jazz, when I was a, in my late teens, I used to play in this uh, piano bar, a great piano player called Phil McKercher. Uh, he used to let me sit on the end of the piano stool and he'd just call jazz standards and I'd have to be able to play them. Most often I didn't know them. 
But I think because of the panic and, and the, the forced necessity for me to be able to get my way through the tunes, I could learn them a lot faster. Now, I'm not certain that is a true representation of neuroplasticity, but definitely the being in a pressured environment that seemed to enable me to, to learn faster. I definitely think it's part of the reason why playing live with other musicians is so important because in that moment, there's this pressure, there's the necessity to be able to learn, which I'm for sure know it speeds up the learning process. Whether that's directly neuroplasticity, I'm not exactly sure. But there are ways that we know that do increase neuroplasticity in your brain, which you can utilize to learn guitar faster. So one of the key findings of the Huberman studies was that failure is in fact one of the key ingredients for releasing those chemicals to create neuroplasticity and therefore learn faster. So when you're doing the same thing over and over again, we're looking for repetitions and you're going to make mistakes while you're doing it. Now, I've been a really big one to, to preach about practicing perfectly all the time. And I do think that's really important. That's to do with the twist in the tail, which we're going to talk a little bit about later. But a really good example of that is something like learning chord changes. If you're learning to change from one chord to another chord, in my courses, I teach it in one minute changes. And I say, don't worry about making mistakes. Just change those chords as fast as you can. So each time you're changing those chords and you're making mistakes, your brain knows that it's not right because you're watching your hand, you're going, oh, that's not right. That failure, that amount, creates those chemicals to uh, make your brain more plasticity, plastic, to be able to allow neuroplasticity to take place, for those changes to happen. Now, what's really interesting, though, is that when you get something right, you get a little hit of a thing in your brain called dopamine. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's like the happy drug. But the little burst of dopamine comes into your brain when you get it the thing right, when you get the chord change right. And then when you stop practicing, that little dopamine hit that came about when you did the chord change perfectly tells your brain, hey, that was the right one. Now, also really important is having a little rest after the practice session, something that I haven't really thought too much about. I do encourage people to take little rests while they're practicing. But when you've just been doing that chord change, go, 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 go. Oh, yeah, I got it right. Okay, keep going. Oh, wrong, wrong, wrong. Your, your brain is like, oh, he's getting it wrong. He's getting it wrong. We need to learn this. We need to learn this. Release those chemicals that allow for the plasticity. So we're learning, we're learning. And then, yay, he got it right. Dopamine comes in. So that tells your brain, hey, that chord change, that particular shape, that movement, whatever, was the right one. And here's the really interesting part is that after you finish practicing, you just have a little bit of quiet time, your brain is able to remove the ones that had the mistake and relying on that little dopamine hit is going to say, hey, that was the right one. That's the one that you've got to remember. Then by having a break, be it a day or a couple of days until you go back to do that one, you will notice that you get things more correct, more often correct, because your brain knows which one it was striving for. Now, on guitar, there is some physical stuff. There's like muscular strength, ability to control your fingers. All of those things are going to grow, grow with time as well. A lot of it's to do with being able to use this plasticity about repetitions, allowing yourself to fail. This really blew my mind because I've known that the one minute changes thing has been really, really effective for a long time, 10 years more. I never really understood why, but this is why. And it was like, got it. Somebody's figured out this is why this exercise is so effective. So it's one of the little adaptations I'm going to make in my uh, suggested practice routines for beginners is just taking that little break, 30 seconds, just of quiet time. Don't rush in and don't look at something else. Don't look at social media or fill your brain up with other rubbish. Just stop, chill out, close your eyes, let your brain sort out that sort of stuff before you continue practicing. Like I said, this stuff is particularly useful for older learners. Okay, when you're kids, you, that stuff is already happening. You're going to be learning all the time, whether you like it or not, okay? Important, whether you like it or not. So you've got to make sure you respect that learning process when you're young and also respect it later on. We're going to talk, like I said, about ways of, of keeping this plasticity door open in a little bit, which is super interesting and really, really fun. So understanding that this repetition and making mistakes is okay and that your brain is going to fire off that dopamine when you get it right, and your brain will sort out the right from the wrong later on, and while you sleep as well. Good sleep, really important for this kind of learning. If you want to learn most effectively, make sure you're getting good kip. But I still don't feel like 
it's the correct approach all the time to make loads of mistakes. A good example, learning scales. Uh, my teacher, when I was in high school, wrote down a scale wrong, the uh, pattern, what I now know as pattern five of the major scale. I'd learned it as the pure minor scale, but he must have just been in a hurry. He put a little circle wrong. I still sometimes make that mistake. If I'm going to make a mistake on that, it's always the same one because I learned it wrong. And I would encourage you not to learn things wrong. Okay? And this is where the really fun twist in the tail comes. So if you're learning, say, practicing a scale or something where it's a fairly complicated, long technical thing, and one of the things where I've been talking about and raving on the, you know, in the lesson saying how important it is that you get it right, right away, I would suggest that you make your brain plastic another way. Because one of the thi another thing from the Hoovman thing that just really blew me out was that once you get into this fully plastic state, it lasts for a while, up to an hour, or around an hour, I think he said. Now, here's the, this is the really fun part, right? So get ready. There are a few ways of triggering this response. Like I said, it's failure, but it's also failure to frustration. If you can get really, keep doing this same thing and you're getting really frustrated with it, your brain's going, oh, this isn't working. We have to figure out a way to do this. So it starts to release those chemicals to make the brain nice and plastic. One of the strongest ways of developing that is ex physical exercises that use balance. Now, guitar doesn't use balance. But there are other exercises that do that you could try for five minutes before you do your guitar practice that's going to help keep, give you that plastic state and help you learn guitar faster. Now, this is absolutely nuts. But let's say, um, for me, I've been doing it, and I have actually been doing this. I've been experimenting with doing handstands because I can't do a handstand. In fact, it always annoys me, the fact that I can't do handstands. So for the last two weeks I've been doing handstands before I've been doing my practice for five minutes I'm getting better but I'm still really wobbly and it's still really frustrating but the fact that it's a balance based exercise that I can't do sends all of these chemicals for hyper uh, neuroplasticity and then I go about doing my guitar practice for the stuff that I want to learn at the moment I'm learning uh, different patterns of the altered scale because it's something that I've always struggled to learn. Uh, figure that I'm not going to delay it anymore. It's a good tester for me to be doing this and it really seems to be working. Okay, you're going to have to try it. But doing handstands for most people, that's probably maybe a little bit too far. Especially if you're a lot older. If you're, uh, you know, uh, not massively fit or uh, an older person who doesn't feel comfortable even attempting a handstand, it might be something like standing on one leg. Right, Just balancing on one leg is already pretty hard for a lot of people. It's trying to do a yoga pose or whatever on one leg. If standing on one leg is really easy, maybe standing on tippy toes on one leg. Maybe getting at one of those wobble boards, those flat boards with a little half circle, half a ball underneath, and then trying to balance on one leg with one of those. That's really difficult. Okay, That'd probably be safer uh, than doing handstands because I nearly knocked over the camera that I'm talking to right now, trying to do my handstands in the studio. Now I'm doing it in a different part of the house. But you get the idea. Doing a balance-based exercise that you can't do for five minutes before you practice is going to help you learn guitar faster. How weird is that? Don't recommend trying to practice guitar upside down. That might be pushing it, taking it a little bit too far. But it is such a cool idea. You get all of this plasticity. You know you're about to learn something. So you go and do a little bit of the ba balance-based activity first. Then you sit down and practice and you'll learn faster. So uh, my suggestion when it comes time to practice is looking at what exactly the exercises are and trying to figure out whether it's one where doing lots of the mistakes is going to help you because your brain, a good one might be string bending. You're doing that string bend over and over again. You're not getting it right. You're not getting it right. But when you do get it right, you'll be like, wow, I've got it really in tune. Dopamine hit, your brain will know, ha, this is going to be the, the one to do it. So therefore, you've, you know, when you stop practicing, your brain will sort out the good ones from the bad ones. A little bit of practice on that over a few weeks or a few months, you start you know, noticing that your bending is getting a lot more in tune than it would have been had you just been doing it really slowly and carefully and trying to bend it every time. I still hold that learning really 
complicated, long things, pieces of music, stuff like that, I don't think the right approach is to be making lots of mistakes. If I'm learning a new song, I don't want to be learning it wrong, learning it wrong, learning it wrong, learning it wrong. Oh, I got one right, great. Don't mean hit, learn it. You know, I don't feel like that's the most effective way of learning. I really don't. So therefore, in those circumstances, you want to go for an experiment with the balanced basic, balanced exercises that require balance before you start your guitar learning. And really, do go and check out those podcasts if you're not believing me, because he's like a proper dude who really knows his stuff. So go and have a listen. He'll convince you. You can do. You can research the backstory. You get, he references loads of studies that you want to read if you're that much inclined to do it. I'm not going into all of the, the technical terms, even though I might be able to sprout out some of them because I'm a bit worried about getting them wrong and making myself look stupid. But do go and check it out. I, I, I really researched this, not just those podcasts. I did go back and read some of the studies that he referenced in the, in the podcast. I did some external research as well, and it really holds up. It's, it's a really fascinating and fun. I, I, like, I love the idea that some of you guys are going to be standing on one leg trying to work on your balance before you're doing your guitar. I know this all sounds a little bit crazy. I I wouldn't have believed it either if it hadn't have come from such an eminent scholar in the field. But really, it's incredible. But a little bit of balanced based exercise, five to seven minutes before you start your guitar practice is going to make it way, way more effective. Incredible. Well, I really hope you found this fun and you find it effective moving forward. Do go and check out the Hoobman Lab podcast as well. It's full of interesting stuff, not just on learning, but about how to use our bodies and brains better. Uh, it is somewhat technical, but it's understandable and digestible for people like me that aren't scientists, me and maybe you as well, maybe you're a scientist. Uh, super, super interesting. On Yeah, like I said, a whole range of different topics. Uh, it's on all the major platforms, so do go and check it out. Uh, he covers a lot of other things as part of those talks, which are things that I already cover as part of my effective practice series, which is part of the grade three lessons, which are available over on the website. So if you want to learn a little bit more about why it's really useful to use a timer uh, and the uh, importance of having a practice uh, routine, all that sort of stuff, that's already covered. So I haven't gone into those details in this particular lesson. That's all part of the grade three course. Do go and check it out. Have yourselves an absolutely fantastic day and I'll see you for plenty more lessons very soon. You'll take care. Bye-bye.